this, if you're following along in your program, program, this is the panel Night Moves. As other moderators have pointed out, bios are in the pamphlet, so I'm gonna skip that step and just inter introduce, I was gonna say interview, uh, introduce the, the two panelists who are gonna come up and, and do their um, presentations. Um, and then we'll talk and have um, questions from the audience. Uh, first is Daniel Miller, who's a staff writer at the Los Angeles Times, who's gonna talk about street racing. And then uh, Miguel Ordignana, who's the manager of the Community Science Program at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, who's gonna talk about mammals on the move. So gentlemen, if you wanna just come up, um, sort of let everybody see you, and then we'll have, then we'll, then, um, all right, so Daniel and Miguel, there you go, all right. It's like, it's just like kindergarten, like show and tell. Uh, and Daniel's gonna, Daniel's gonna start us off. Hi everyone, can you hear me? So at night, Los Angeles is a uh, street racer's paradise. That's how I like to think of it. It's a, it's a place of chrome and gambling and speed. Um, I'm a staff reporter at the Los Angeles Times and I spent a year working on a podcast about street racing and one street racer in particular and I got to know this world in an in-depth way. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my reporting uh, over the last year and some of the things that didn't make it into the podcast or my stories in the LA Times. Um, I spent a lot of nights on a lot of darkened streets in Los Angeles uh, looking for street races, interviewing street racers, eventually seeing some street races and ultimately running from the police myself. Um, it was a fantastic exercise in uh, beat reporting uh, and uh, I'd love to talk uh, more about it today. Uh, one thing I want to start with is just to tell you a little bit about the podcast. So uh, Larger Than Life came out earlier this year. It's the story of Big Willie Robinson. Uh, Big Willie was a legendary Los Angeles street racer who uh, first made his name on the streets of South LA in the 1960s. Uh, Big Willie had a pretty radical idea, especially for a street racer. Um, he believed that cars could unite people, and in the wake of the Watts riots, he put this to the test. Um, in South LA, he started staging illegal street races right around 1966, so a year after the riots. Um, the city was still raw, but I think that the powers that be were desperate for change and, and looking to a, a local leader who could help bridge divides, and Willie did just that. Um, uh, Willie was six foot six, muscle bound titan, originally from New Orleans, and he was captivating uh, with his physical presence and as a, as a public speaker. He was a natural born leader, and he brought order to this world of street racing. Street racing, of course, we should say, is illegal, it's clandestine, and it's not something that the authorities are typically interested in. Um, but in Willie, um, the LAPD, um, and uh, multiple mayors and city council members found somebody with whom they could work. Uh, Willie could um, uh, mix it up in Hollywood, he could mix it up at City Hall. Here he is with a, an official uh, Darth Vader uh, uh, character sent by Lucasfilm to Willie's racetrack on Terminal Island. Um, Willie uh, had relationships with uh, uh, several of the filmmakers behind Star Wars and there's some uh, perhaps apocryphal stories about um, him being offered the role of Darth Vader in the original film. Um, Willie was also an activist, it's important to note. Um, he fought hard for a racetrack at Terminal Island because he ultimately believed that street racing needed to get off of city streets and be brought to a place where it could be conducted in a safe manner. Uh, he had a racetrack on Terminal Island on and off for 20 years. Here he is protesting in front of City Hall after his track was uh, shut down. And he was really a student working the media. Um, he cultivated friendships with reporters. He was friends with Otis Chandler, then the publisher of the LA Times, and he used these relationships to his advantage. Uh, he, he really was larger than life. Uh, in getting to know Big Willie and his world, I knew I had to get on the streets of, of Los Angeles and see some street racing for myself. Um, because this is a true subculture with its own set of rules and standards and language, it was not easy to get into this world. It took some time and it took a lot of uh, standing around on uh, deserted streets in South LA wondering where the action was. Um, I want to show you a video that gives a little bit of a sense of what the reporting was uh, actually like.
So a couple of things that I want to say really at the outset. Um, one thing that I was really struck by with street racing at night in Los Angeles is that racing transforms these mundane spaces into sporting venues. And that's really by design. Street racers are looking for places that are essentially deserted, flat, and straight, and well lit. So what you wind up with are very long, empty streets in industrial neighborhoods. Um, what you wind up with are parking lots of strip centers um, close to freeways. It's really sort of um, a subculture that's tied to the geography of the city. Uh, at the same time, LA is a perfect place for street racing. And of course, there's street racing in, in uh, every major city and in every country probably around the world where there's a car culture. Um, but LA is uniquely suited to it because of our freeway system and you know our beloved freeway system which is so miserable to deal with most days empties out at two, three, four o'clock in the morning and it really is perfect. It really is paradise and I can't tell you how uncanny it is you know to get on the um, you know 110 near downtown at one in the morning and travel you know 30 miles and it you know go by in a blink of the eye. Um, you know, right now the LA Times, uh, you know, or re recently the LA Times moved from downtown to El Segundo. A lot of our commutes have lengthened, and that same drive would take, you know, an hour and a half um, in, in rush hour that many reporters at the paper experience. So um, that's what I was really struck by, how uh, it's sort of this, um, uh, uh, it, it's sort of a, a uncanny thing that the street racers have done. They've transformed these mundane spaces into something that has become sort of quite useful to them. Uh, of course, when I first started street racing, I'd show up, when I first started reporting on street racing, I'd show up to streets getting a tip from uh, a racer to head to a certain place, and this is what I'd mostly see, you know, tire marks. And it would mostly look like this. And it'd be kind of eerie. I'd be, you know, in Compton or Willowbrook or Rancho Dominguez, sitting by the side of the road with my big tape recorder, and, and I'd be the only person around. Um, sometimes it would be obvious that I had just missed a race, uh, what you see right here are very fresh uh, tire marks from, from people doing burnouts and then ultimately racing. And the reason for this is a lot of these races are organized via social media and via a text message. And um, it's very secretive and there are so many efforts taken to avoid detection by authorities. So although things are put on social media, they're taken down very quickly, venues are changed very quickly, and really only those in the know uh, have a sense of where the race is actually going to be. Um, ultimately, of course, you saw the video. I did wind up getting to see some street races, and I wound up getting to spend some time with racers, and here's a good example of where racers would convene. So this is actually uh, a parking lot of a, of a Del Taco in, um, in Compton. This is one of those other mundane places that just gets transformed when the racers show up. So I, on this night in particular, uh, it was a Friday night of a holiday weekend, so you had a sense that people were really going to cut loose. Uh, we stood around in this parking lot for an hour and a half, I want to say. And what went down was a lot of gamesmanship, a lot of trash talking, and a lot of organizing of races. And one thing that I learned on this night that I was just fascinated by was how the racers used different jurisdictions within the Southland to plan, to plan their events. So this Del Taco is in Compton. The race that was being planned this evening was in the city of Los Angeles. And it, that was very deliberate. What the racers were doing was, they were trying to jam up the two different police forces that they suspected would be paying attention to what they were doing. So they figured that if Compton police were aware of 
these many people congregating in this parking lot, that it would just be one extra layer of communication that would have to go down for them to alert the LAPD that a race might be happening in their area. So all of the betting, all of the discussion of how a race might occur, everything's discussed uh, beforehand in this parking lot, and then the racers get in their cars, drive a few blocks away into the city of Los Angeles and conduct their race, and then ultimately head back to the city of Compton to talk more trash and organize uh, the next race. So what does an actual race look like? So this was a race that um, I spent some time at uh, around 135th Street in Maine. I think that's near Willowbrook. Um, this was about one or two in the morning. And uh, one thing that I was really struck by was by the diversity of people who were there. I interviewed people who were from the San Fernando Valley, people from the South Bay, people from South Los Angeles. They had all come to the spot because they'd heard about it either via text message or via a post on Instagram. And there was even a little bit of an underground economy going on there. There was a guy selling pupusas out of the back of his van. There was uh, somebody who was functioning almost like a hype man. He had a big black SUV. The, uh, the trunk was open. His sub subwoofers were on display. And he was the musical entertainment for that night. He even had a microphone at one point to address the crowd. Um, but there was no leader, there was nobody who was really bringing all these people together. It happened sort of on the fly, um, and it was fascinating to see how this community could come together. And I, one thing that I would say is that, perhaps like many of you, my, my sense of the world of street racing was from Fast and Furious movies, or maybe a video game like Grand Theft Auto. Um, and you have, uh, obviously, this very cinematic idea of what it's going to look like. Um, or, you know, uh, the way that people might behave, that there could be fights, that there could be drinking, that there could be drugs. But it wasn't like that. Um, in fact, the street races that I attended over the course of the year were pretty organized and pretty quiet. And, and I think one of the interesting reasons for that is um, this is about gambling and this is about making money. And so people are taking it very seriously. You'd be surprised how quiet the scene was. Besides the gentleman with the, with the subwoofers in his trunk, the people who were there to race were there to make money. So they were taking this seriously. Um, at the center of any street race is the flagger. And you can actually see the flagger at the bottom left of that photo. He's got a backward cap on. And he's actually wearing the vest of the Brotherhood of Street Racers. The Brotherhood of Street Racers was the group founded by Big Willie Robinson. Although he died in 2012, his group still lives on. And the flagger is essential for keeping the peace at the race and, and mostly for uh, keeping things organized. If there is one figurehead, it's this person. Um, they stand in between the two cars and with the drop of a hand, the cars are off and that's how the race begins. Um, it's interesting to know that you know in Big Willie's day, um, he could command the crowd perhaps better than anybody, and there's nobody that's really replaced him. If you open up the pages of the LA Times um, or, or any other local news outlet, you'll, you'll read stories or, or, or see stories on television about deaths related to street racing and violence related to the street racing scene. Um, and I'm not here to, to glamorize it. Um, it's certainly a real problem, and law enforcement has a street racing task force to address those issues. Um, but. What I was struck by in the course of reporting this was uh, the sense of organization and um, kind of rigidity to the scene and how um, these people kind of wait for sunset to turn LA into their you know, sort of sporting arena. Um, I've mentioned a little bit about Big Willie. You've saw, seen some photos of him. Um, the story wouldn't have been done without him. Um, people called him the king of the street in his day. And so I thought um, I would let you hear from him in his own words to, to conclude. We use racing, racing to stop killings. That's Big Willie Robinson. You've probably never heard of him, but to some, Big Willie is a legend. Six foot six, 300 pound Vietnam vet, a freaking war hero. He's the man. His biceps were as big as my weight. There's nowhere you're going to find this, but he was asked to be Darth Vader. Big Willie founded the Brotherhood of Street Racers in the 1960s. They're a band of gearheads guided by his vision of peace, fellowship, and speed. He 
sound like somebody giving a, a sermon at a church. Well, our brother could we have one thing in common. We like to street race our fast cars, right? But he did more than race cars. He could make cops and the rest of L.A. see eye to eye. The LAPD was considered the enemy of the people. He made an opening for himself to be a peacemaker. I'm Daniel Miller, staff writer at the Los Angeles Times. I wanted to know how a figure like Big Willie could fall so quickly into obscurity, and I had questions about some parts of his life that just didn't seem to add up. From LA Times Studios, this is Larger Than Life, a documentary podcast about LA street racer Big Willie Robinson. All seven episodes are out now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Anyhow, um, I'm very curious to hear your questions in a little bit, and thanks so much. Second, everybody, I'm just swapping computers here. Can I ask Daniel a question before you well, go for it? Did you ever ride along? So I was never in uh, any street racers' cars. Uh, so when we started this project, I asked the lawyer at the LA Times, you know, um, what, what, what? I, I'm going to be going to street races. What should I do if the cops show up? And he just said, just don't get arrested. <laughs> and so uh, that was actually good advice, and I didn't get arrested. Um, but I, I never was in a car with the Razors. But like I said, this is serious, and money is on the line. I don't think they would have been interested, because I'd add you know, 150, 160 pounds to their car. <laughs> thank you. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's really awesome, but a little surreal to be here. I used to come here as a little boy um, into this library. So my mom uh, was a single mother at the time and would, was going to school and working full time and would take me here when, when she didn't have a babysitter. And, and I would just be roaming through the halls, making her study time very difficult until she would <laughs> give up and take me to the Natural History Museum across the street. Um, fast forward a few decades, and now I'm a graduate of USC as well, and also um, now working at the Natural History Museum. So um, it's really great to be here. And to, what I'm going to talk about today are um, basically my passion, which are nocturnal urban mammals and non-human urban mammals. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the most charismatic and controversial species that call LA home and how I'm able to study them and other people are able to study them here in Los Angeles and hopefully um, develop a, hopefully a, a more of appreciation for them uh, here amongst this, this room here. And so, um, and talk about their nocturnal behavior and why they're using that strategy and how some species are more adaptable to the city than others. And when you think of mammals and ones that you see often, um, usually think about probably squirrels you see on your lunch break eating your pizza or somebody else's pizza maybe, um, or that cat that you see roaming around um, your garden or your backyard, um, or maybe even an opossum. Um, when I say nocturnal, it doesn't mean that they're always active at night. It's just usually they're active at night. So some of the most nocturnal animals, raccoons, coyotes, depending on the situation, They'll take advantage of the daylight as well. Um, and sometimes they'll be napping in your garden, um, like this opossum here, uh, who was napping right across the street in our nature gardens at the museum. Um, but like I said, most often, almost all species of mammals here are nocturnal, and that's for a reason. Um, this is a group of raccoons in our nature gardens pond right across the street. Um, taking advantage of the evening when people are gone. We get uh, thousands of people at the museum sometimes, and um, it's advantageous for them to be away from human sight at that time. Um, there's less danger when, there, when humans are not there, um, but some species 
can really take advantage of the night by depending on their size, depending on what they can eat or what they can't eat, um, and also their behavior, um, how bold they are. And so raccoons are kind of that sweet spot where they're small and they're aggressive and bold when they need to be, and they can eat almost anything you can imagine. So that's just one example. And here they are, here's a group in the LA River when I was studying wildlife in the LA River, and they can make a home out of the LA River. Bobcats, on the other hand, also call LA home, um, are also pretty small, uh, smaller than people think, about double, triple the size of a house cat. Um, but even though they're small, they are, because they are cats, they can only eat meat. They're obligate carnivores. And so that limits their opportunity to take advantage of all neighborhoods of LA, like a raccoon. And so, um, so yes, this bobcat is on the LA River bike path, but it's using it more as a corridor rather than as a home. Does that make sense? How there's a difference there? And, um, and so this bobcat is using this river, this concrete path, as a way to get to one big open space uh, from another. So Griffith Park to Elysian Park to soft bottom stretches of the LA River to find food and prey and cover. Um, and also another thing about bobcats is that they're very shy. They're not as bold as a raccoon is. And so they don't like to be seen. They're solitary animals um, and pretty territorial. And what studies have shown with all carnivores um, is that when you are studying carnivores in areas where people and humans and, peop and carnivores um, overlap, they'll tend to come out later and later the more human activity there is in that particular location. Um, so that kind of limits them as well. So say you're in a really busy park that has a curfew that doesn't end until 10 p.m., like Griffith Park, for instance, a lot of mammals um, that are secretive will have to come out later, hunt, start hunting later, start looking for mates later and the resources that they need, and it's basically condensing their time to do what they need to do, um, do based on human activity. But nonetheless, like I said, bobcats are here for a reason. They're very adaptable animals. Um, I was able to discover a bobcat in Highland Park at Debs Park, previous to finding one there. It was unthinkable for a bobcat to be in the middle of Highland Park. Um, but it's just, it's a matter of just looking. I don't, I'm not necessarily a very talented scientist, um, but I've decided to take it upon myself to look where nobody else, else has looked for these mammals. Unfortunately, sometimes the way you kind of um, are become aware of their presence in certain areas, like this bobcat in Elysian Park, is unfortunately when they're already dead. And for the sad thing is um, we're noticing some of these species like gray foxes and bobcats in areas where they, we thought they're already gone, we're noticing that they're there because they're found dead on the side of a road or getting hit by cars. Um, and then, fortunately, then I'm able to look, use cameras, um, remotely activated or, or uh, motion activated cameras to study them further to see if they are out there. Um, so. But the idea is, the goal of mine and a lot of other scientists nowadays is to hopefully find them and understand their health, the population health, before it's too late, before this is the last bobcat of Elysian Park, or Debs Park for that matter. Um, and so I've taken it upon myself, as well as other scientists, to look for these wide-ranging nocturnal animals um, throughout the city in developed areas uh, or disturbed habitat like golf courses. So here's a pack of coyotes gathering for the night at a golf course in Griffith Park. Um, and coyotes are really special because they're the most adaptable of all these urban carnivores and have a little bit of size as well to, to give them a little bit of advantage. So here's a coyote in Altadena backyard chasing off a bear, a black bear. And you never think, consider that to ever happen, um, but what we think is happening here, if I slow down the footage, you can see nipples on this female uh, protruding. And so it's indicating that it's a lactating female, likely has a den nearby. Otherwise, it would not be um, sensible for this coyote to be taking on a black bear. Um, so that's what we think is happening here. And with more, as a, 
community science program, as we're becoming more known in the community, people are sending us their security camera footage um, as more Nest cameras and Ring doorbell cameras are out there. Um, people are sharing those videos and that information with us, which is awesome. And we're learning where coyotes are and aren't, and they really aren't uh, basically not in any neighborhood. They're in every single neighborhood we've set, surveyed, basically. And we're finding even the, them in downtown LA, Westlake Village. Um, and I've taken upon myself to help the Park Service out as a volunteer to study what they're eating. That's a big controversial thing. What are coyotes doing in the cities? How much of a danger are they to pets and to humans? Um, and we're learning in some local South LA parks that yes, they are eating cats. They're eating atherogenic food. Um, but a lot of that is because that's what's available and that's how they're surviving. Um, and then the question is, is it up to us to keep our pets safe? Um, is, it, is it the coyote's fault to, for killing that outdoor cat? Um, or is it our fault for not keeping that cat or dog, chihuahua, inside? Um, and we're able, the Park Service has been able to compare what's been, what coyotes are eating in the city versus the suburbs of LA. Um, and it's very different. Um, so urban coyotes are eating more cats, anthropogenic items, um, and ha are eating that consistently throughout the year. Um, suburban coyotes are eating um, anthropogenic foods only during the dry season when native prey species are not as available. Um, so that's interesting, I think, and says a lot what their true preferences are. Um, but also think about what if coyotes were removed? Uh, what would happen then? And it's important to notice that coyotes in areas where they're in low densities are totally gone, um, there's this release in the population of cats. Um, and native bird species and lizards are not used to having a bunch of cats in their ecosystem. And so as a result, cats, if they're not controlled by a, t by a predator um, or something that displaces them from an area, they can really push bird populations, lizard populations to extinction. And so that's something to think about as well when people are complaining about having coyotes or not in their neighborhood. Gray foxes are another um, uh, carnivore species that a lot of people don't think about. Um, they're the, one of only two dog species in the world that can climb trees. Um, the other is the raccoon dog in Asia. And um, that's how we think they're surviving here in LA, a, a landscape that's dominated by coyotes um, because they have overlapping diet and range. So they're able to escape coyotes by climbing up trees um, and even living in, in old snags and, and, and dead trees, things like that. Finding them in Griffith Park and even in smaller places as well. And of course, they're getting captured on ring doorbell cameras. <laughs> like that one there. Um, but all these carnivores, no matter how adaptable they are, are vulnerable to our expansion of roads especially because these roads are creating islands of habitat. And if you're a very wide-ranging animal, that needs more space than what a, what a particular park can offer, these, these freeways are death traps. Roads are death traps for you. And it's not just deer getting caught in headlights like this one here. Um, this is a bridge going over the 101, and fortunately this deer did survive. Um, but if you're a mountain lion, um, you're almost on the brink of extinction, and that's really the case for our local mountain lions out here. This is P22, Griffith Park mountain lion. Um, I've been photographing for a few years now. Um, but just to show you, here's a map of um, all the roadkill deaths of mountain lions here in the LA area since they've, been started, since they've been studied in 2002. So there's more than this, but to date there's been 16 ma mountain lion d deaths along our highways and roads. And they're particularly vulnerable to getting hit by cars because they're extremely wide-ranging animals because of their size. And because they're cats, like the bobcat, they only eat meat. So if you're big, you can't really persist on backyard rats and rabbits. If you're a mountain lion, you have to have deer. And deer need a lot of space to themselves. So they're reliant on these big chunks of habitat for them to be able to persist. 
and to be able to get between one patch of habitat to another. Otherwise, they'll end up having conflict amongst each other, especially males. They really are so territorial that they are killing each other over space. And literally, that is the leading cause of death for local mountain lions, um, in addition to getting hit by cars. And they're also inbreeding with each other um, because they really have nowhere else to go. And so fathers and grandfathers are mating with their own grandchildren and, and, and offspring. Um, so it's a bad situation, and it's estimated that they will go extinct within 50 years from now if connectivity is not improved within our local um, habitat. Um, so here's an example of one mountain lion that was killed by um, getting hit by a car, and the one on the, your left was killed by rat poison exposure. And that has killed recent, most recently two mountain lions. Um, those are the most recent puma deaths locally were due to rat poison exposure. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, but back to P22, the Griffith Park mountain lion, I wanted to share his story because it really summarizes the situation for mountain lions here locally with a very extreme situation, I guess. Um, I started a study with Dan Cooper, who spoke earlier, um, to look at connectivity between Griffith Park and other open spaces. And this was a really personal project for me because um, not only was I a carnivore biologist, but I grew up right outside of Griffith Park. Literally, um, and that was a, my Yosemite. And so I really wanted to prove to the rest of um, the city and scientists included that Griffith Park was a valuable wildlife oasis and not just a place for recreation. And so um, we ended up documenting a mountain lion. This was a huge surprise. We just were hoping to get deer and bobcats and coyotes. And then I got a photo of a mountain lion. This is actually the first photo that I saw and big puma butt, basically. <laughs> and after seeing bobcat butt after bobcat butt or coyote butt, I was used to these small things. And seeing this, it was, I was basically in disbelief. It was like seeing Bigfoot or La Chupacabra for the very first time because it's like a mythical creature. People talk about pumas and confuse them for other animals that they see. Um, but this is the real deal in my backyard, basically, our backyard here in LA. Um, and the question was, um, where did it come from? We knew it was a male because that little black dot under the tail um, only exists for males because that's residue from them scent marking. But we didn't know if he came from the Verdugos to the north or the west, um, the western Santa Monica's. Um, but even some scientists were in such disbelief that he was there, they thought he was an escape pet from a local Hollywood Hills mansion. Um, so I won't name any names, but um, that was a rumor that existed. Um, but he was captured. I, I helped the Park Service find a good place for them to catch him um, so that they can measure, take some measurements, figure out more information about him, put a tracking device on his neck, um, and also take some blood. And, and they took blood to get his DNA um, to figure out if he was related to any of the other pumas that they studied before. And P22 is, stands for Puma 22, the 22nd Puma studied here in LA. And his father, um, based on his genetics, was P1, Puma 1, the very first Puma ever studied. And P1 lived his whole life west of the 405 freeway. So that meant that P22 had to have been born west of the 405. So now we're trying to kind of start to unravel the story of why he might have ended up in Griffith Park. He's in this very territorial situation. His dad was the most territorial male ever studied. He killed multiple females, multiple males, multiple individuals, his own offspring included. Um, and so he was likely next. And so he had the choice of fighting his own dad for territory or leaving. And he decided to leave, which is also another dangerous option because two other mountain lions were killed trying to cross the 405. Um, east. But he ended up doing that, crossed through Beverly Hills, Bel Air, uh, Franklin Canyon area, Studio City, and very close to Hollywood, he did another unprecedented crossing of the 101 freeway, another major 10-lane freeway, right near the Ford Amphitheater, it seems like. And so this was his last crossing that he had to make um, over this busy highway, and I was able to discover him very, very close to the Ford Amphitheater, right above the ridge, very near that uh, cross that you see when you always drive past that area. Um, 
And then we thought the story would end there. We thought, okay, this is a really cool story. This mountain lion made it over there, but he's going to die. Um, his dad, to give you some reference, used 200 square miles all to himself. And that's the natural home range territory size for a male. Griffith Park is one of the biggest city parks in the country, but it's only nine square miles, if you include Forest Lawn and Warner Brothers Studios property. And so he's only in a fraction of what a mountain lion usually typically uses and needs. And so people thought he'd starve to death or just leave to look for something bigger and get hit by a car or have conflict with somebody. But he's proved people wrong again. And he's been living there ever since. He's still alive to this day. Um, and a secret to his survival is kind of depicted in this series of pictures here. So here he is in, one of my in front of one of my cameras. There he is zoomed in there in that circle. And less than 30 seconds later, a hiker walks in front, and he's gone. So obviously, he has a lot of opportunities. There's homeless people living in the park. There's people out there till 10 PM at night or later. There's people living right against the park um, in homes included, and lots of pets even. And he's not really taking advantage of any of that. He's keeping to his natural behavior. Um, and yes, occasionally, he will go through people's properties. But it is to get from one chunk of open space um, in search of deer. Um, and here's another cool one I wanted to share of him getting spooked by somebody and then leaping over an eight-foot fence. Yeah. So, yeah, as you saw the car that spooked him there. Um, but people now learning about mountain lion behavior and how they can coexist. And National Geographic published an article about him um, a few years ago. LA Times did as well. Um, had mul has multiple articles about him. But basically showing that he's not living in one particular place in Griffith Park. He uses all of the park in search of deer. And also, he patrols his territory on a regular basis. And he eats deer. 87% of his diet is deer, just like any other mountain lion in the most rural parts of California. And 13% is coyotes and raccoons. And the 13%, though, puts him at risk because people are putting rat poison out in their backyards. The park, the city, is putting rat poison out in the parks to control for rodents and rats. And as a result, um, this puts, makes pumas and other carnivores vulnerable to dying directly from poison or dying from other diseases as they also fight off this, the effects of this rat poison exposure. So he almost died from mange because he had a lot of rat poison in him and couldn't fight off the mange and almost died from the mange uh, exposure. And so here's a, a nice graphic to show you. So that blue polygon you see on the bottom there is his dad's territory. And that green circle around Griffith Park is his territory, just to see how small his territory is. And another uh, really great example of why it's really advantageous to stay nocturnal if you're a big carnivore like him is this example here. He got found, it was found by a security team putting security cameras under a house uh, while he was just resting under there. And he was found during the day. The media came, wildlife officials came, and he nearly died that day because um, people cornered him. They had a live interview right in that crawl space and shot him with tennis ball guns. But fortunately, he kept his cool. He waited for those people to tire themselves out um, and shut off the lights. And he escaped, and nobody even saw him leave, even though, even though they had media trucks and helicopters throughout the night. Nobody saw him leave. Um, and why? Why should we care? Um, why Mountain lions don't seem to be doing well here in LA. Uh, why should they be here? And, but my answer is, why not? Um, they've been here since the Ice Age, since we've had saber-toothed cats here. They've outlived all those animals. And they deserve to be here just as much as we do, just as much as coyotes deserve to be here, bobcats as well. They've also been here since the Ice Age. And also, it's a, a sense of pride, I hope, for people. We're one of only two mega cities in the world that can claim that they have a big cat living within their city limits. The other is Mumbai and India. And that's it for the world. And so um, I hope people take pride in that. And also, in addition to that, He's an ambassador for a campaign that really hasn't, hadn't really gained any momentum until he, his story came out. There's been efforts to build a crossing over the 101 in Agoura Hills to connect the Santa Monica Mountains to the Santa Susanas for many, many years, but no momentum until P22 
began um, being, becoming the ambassador for that campaign, the Save LA Cougars campaign. And now, not only will this crossing, hopefully when it's built in hopefully a couple of years, will not only benefit mountain lions and save them from extinction locally, but it also will help all, the, all, all these other species, including birds, salamanders, um, and other species that also rely on connectivity to also have a sustainable future here in Los Angeles. Um, and he also has a, a exhibit at the Natural History Museum dedicated to him so that people like myself don't have to struggle to find their way into a science career or a conservation career or think that they have to go to Africa to study wildlife. There's really cool wildlife that live here in LA that we should take pride in and, and protect. And this is an example of a school in Highland Park um, that is really proud and rallying behind P22. Um, the story's not over, though. There's another second mountain lion that crossed the 405 five years ago. And he's still there within the 405 and the 101 gap. Here he is chasing a deer in a Bel Air backyard. You'll see him come in there. There he is. Um, so that's uh, the next, next uh, chapter of that story. And last, I'm going to end up with the, uh, end with this. Um, I've studied bats as well. Um, and the reason I study bats is because nobody wants to study them. Um, and people, they're just a really controversial species, like predators. And, um, and they need to be studied. They have a great benefit, potential benefit to people. They eat thousands of mosquitoes a night. And mosquitoes, as you know, are carriers, or, uh, carriers, or carriers of disease um, and also control crop pests. Um, but the way to study them is you have to take advantage of their ability to echolocate. And each species of bat has a re really unique call. So we're able to take advantage of that um, aspect. So if you're not familiar with echolocation, they use it basically to see better at night. Um, they can use these echoes to locate prey, to talk to each other, and also so that they don't fly into that window or that tree. Um, and like I said, each species has a unique call pattern, and I'm able to see what species are in what area based on their call pattern. Up to uh, a project that I, the point where I started a project a few years ago, we only knew that bats were generally in the LA County area, but people, most people thought they were just in our open spaces. Nobody really cared about what was going on in the, the rest of the city of LA County. And if 75% of LA County is built up residential pri private property, you're missing a huge chunk of information by not surveying what's happening in, in our backyard. So that's where community science comes in. And so we've had a lot of partners, mostly family, families from neighborhoods such as Watts, Southgate, um, Pasadena, you name it. We've, we've sampled 40 plus backyards um, and neighborhoods, and every single place we've surveyed has detected a bat. So this project is not only allowing nerdy scientists like me learn more about bat distribution, but it's also connecting people with nature that may have felt disconnected from nature before. Um, so far, we've found 12 species of bats in LA County. Um, most recently, we've been s surveying South Central LA. Of those 12 species, we found seven species in South LA, um, two of which are species of special concern in the state of California, meaning that they're vulnerable to going extinct from California. These two species are foliage specialists, meaning that they only roost in foliage. The one on the left is the yellow bat and only roosts in palms. And, and so if you are part of that um, group that wants all palms removed and replaced, there's, it's a little bit more complicated than that because this is a species of special concern that particularly relies on palms to survive. And this was originally part of its native range. So um, yeah, it makes things difficult and complicated. But we're learning that they're everywhere. This is a South LA map. And the bigger circles represent the, um, more activity and the darker color, or excuse me, the lighter colors represent more species found. And you can see those bigger circles are actually located in parks with these big, massive lakes, like uh, Magic Johnson Park in Willowbrook, for instance. Um, Harbor Regional Park, Ken Malloy Park has that big lake, and, and Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Area. So these little oases, even if they're not a Griffith Park, they're very valuable for bats. And even our nature garden has detected five species of bats. And we only have a tiny little pond there. Um, and th these are all the sites that we surveyed so far, which include the San Fernando Valley, San Gabriel Valley, Central LA, South LA. And I'll end with this slide, which is um, fitting because we're here at USC. Um, I was at a football game um, 
with my family, with my little brothers. And one of my brothers um, knew I studied bats, of course. And he's like, Miguel, there's bats eating moths attracted to the stadium lights. And of course, because I'm a bat nerd, I had a bat detector in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, I pulled it out, put it on my iPhone, blocked people's view behind me and started recording bats and was able to detect that it was a Mexican free tail bat. And why I shared this story is because this is what I think is the next step for, for um, urban wildlife and nature discovery here in LA. As these devices, as this technology makes nature exploration more accessible, I think there's a, time, there's a period when um, this whole stadium will be filled with these detectors. Um, and Friday night lights at high school football games will also be filled with these detectors. And people will now be able to be part of the solution as they can continue to not only familiarize themselves with local nature, but take pride in it. And uh, I'm really excited and hopeful for that time to come soon. All right, thank you very much. All right, that was excellent. Why don't you guys come up and then we'll, um We get about 10 minutes or so for questions from the audience. So I'm, I'm going to, since we're recording, I'll come around with the microphone. Thank you. Hi, thank, thank both of you for these great talks. Uh, my name is Peter Chesney. I actually study car culture. So there are so many ways in which both are very interesting to me. I'm fascinated by the phenomenon, the history of roadkill and stuff like that. And it's terrible that that's our term for it. But you know, it is an interesting way to learn a lot about animals and car culture at the same time. Um, but I actually have, in my dissertation, I have quite a bit on street racing. So I want to have, I have a question for Daniel about street racing. It has to do with police. And you talked a good amount about police, but I have a few other, you know, additional things I'd just like to know about, A, your, your field work, your method, and then B, a question for you to speculate on about the future. Um, and one would be, what were some of the ways in which you were able to do this work without endangering um, some of the people that you, that you, observed in terms of uh, your, your, your stuff not being used as evidence against them. So that's a method question. And then two, um, I think what's really interesting about the history of street racing in LA is the ways in which um, these communities have learned to police themselves. And uh, you know, one of the things I study is police abolition and the police abolition movement. Do you see uh, kind of like a building block or a foundation for police abolition in the capacity for these communities to police themselves? Is there a model for police abolition there? All right, thank you. I feel like I should have had you on the podcast. Um, well, I should be clear that I reached out to all sorts of uh, law enforcement officials f while making this podcast. Uh, the LAPD declined to comment or participate. So did other law enforcement agencies. I did wind up speaking to people tied to the LAPD, like Steve Sobroff, the head of the police commission, and a handful of others. And so it wasn't a secret that I was doing this and that I would be you know, building this podcast around people who were breaking the law. There were people who just simply decided to not participate because they understood what the stakes were. I'm talking about street racers. Um, and I think that they sort of kind of self-regulated that. I was very close with members of the Brotherhood of Street Racers because I spent about a year with Big Willie Robinson's group. And so there were some who just sort of said this wasn't for them, and then others um, who were game. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that there's certainly an element uh, in the world of street racing that's pretty cavalier, and they were ready for the repercussions, whatever they might be. We took care not to show um, people's uh, uh, license plate numbers or their faces if they were actually um, breaking the law. Um, and there isn't a ton of actual street racing footage you guys today saw, saw nearly all of it. So I think that might answer that question. In terms of sort of self-policing and like the internal organization of street racing organizations and how that might be um, a building block and a bridge, I think it's true that I saw a lot of that. Um, and I think that um, media depicts street racers as sort of brazen criminals who are really out to create spectacle and mayhem. Um, but uh, what I saw were, um, uh, in many cases, sportsmen who had found a way to make money and were really interested in doing so in a controlled environment so that they could keep making money. And so I thought that 
there was an element of like uh, weeding out of bad actors and people who might kind of stymie the growth of a particular club. The Brotherhood itself, which is the group that I spent a year with, you know, it's a bit of a unique case and they've long been a bridge toward law enforcement and they've, they've long been there to perhaps in very, very subtle ways change law enforcement's view of street racers because, um, uh, b because their message is sort of peace through wheels. So, uh, you know, I, it might be that my perception is a little bit skewed because I spent so much time with people who were friendly with law enforcement and were hoping to better teach law enforcement about their own culture and their own needs. Um, not all street racers want to get off city streets and open a racetrack where you know, people can unite in peace. So uh, they are unique in that regard. Other questions? Well, I guess I, I can speak loud enough, I think, but I, um, I wondered how old is um, P22, and then what is the life expectancy? You know, you know, normal life expectancy. Yeah, sure. He was found when he's um, two, two and a half years old. So the estimate is that he's now 10 years old. Um, and the li expected life expectancy is basically he's, he's on borrowed time for local LA mountain lions because um, of all the dangers they face. But if in perfect situations in the wild, 10 to 15 years, and captivity, 20 to 30 years. about street racing, uh, you mentioned gambling. Is there a house and how much does the house keep and how much do the racers get and how is this enforced? It's difficult to have an outlaw gambling establishment when the wrong guy loses. How do you make sure they pay up? Sure. So. Um I will just say that Big Willie Robinson, the way he became famous is, was that he was the guy who held the money and nobody was going to mess with him. Six foot six, Mr. America contestant. He actually placed sixth in the Mr. America contest in 1976. So uh, he was the money guy. He held the money. Um, and effectively, um, he was sort of like the modified house and people in his shoes would almost be like that. And um, uh, basically the way that it works is You'll meet in your Del Taco parking lot or something like that. And usually each racer is sort of backed by his club or his crew and will throw in money to a pot, which is held by the, the money guy. Let's say $1,000 on each side. Um, and that's the, that's the sort of official pot that people are racing over. But um, then it breaks down to you know, myriad side bets just among guys um, who are standing around watching, you know, $10 on the Camaro, $10 on the Mustang. And that is, you know, that's kind of on the honor system. And I think, you know, as hokey as it sounds, I think there is sort of is a code to this. And like we discussed earlier, there's a fair amount of self-policing. Honor does matter, and you got to pay up. Um, the stories of people bouncing after losing a race and not paying up or somebody making off with the money are, are infamous among the racers that I met with. You know, people are, you know, banned for life over that stuff. So they do sort of self-regulate. Other questions? So, Daniel, is the Brotherhood still looking for a permanent spot, or have they resigned themselves that it's going to be on the street? So can I just say, Geraldine Natz was uh, uh, kind enough with her expertise uh, with the Port of Los Angeles for her many years uh, uh, managing it to give me a tour uh, when I was working on this project. And the reason that we visited the port together is that Big Willie Robinson's racetrack was at Terminal Island in the Port of Los Angeles. He called it Brotherhood Raceway Park. Um, so Brotherhood Raceway opened in 1975 and then ran on and off until it was closed in uh, 1984. Um, he spent the better part of the 80s fighting like hell to get it reopened. Uh, an opportunity presented itself at, after the Los Angeles riots of 1992. Um, uh, Willie's benefactor had been Tom Bradley. Bradley was soon gone, but replaced by Richard Reardon, who did help him reopen the track. The track was then open for about another 18 months. Um, I, I want to say from 93 to 95 or so. Um, Willie died in 2012. He spent the remaining years of his life trying in vain to open a track either at Terminal Island uh, or elsewhere. He looked at places like Palmdale. He looked at areas adjacent to LAX. The Brotherhood still is trying to open a racetrack. And... Um, it is a very emotional subject for the group. Um, it lost Willie, and, and it also lost its track. And without those two things, it, it sort of became unmoored. There are leaders of the group. Um, some of the people in the podcast um, 
a guy named Fabian Arroyo, another racer named Donald Galaz, um, are ardent believers in Willie's vision of peace through wheels. And uh, they have regular dialogue with city council members, but without a figurehead like Big Willie who could really cross the divide, they've struggled to make any real inroads in terms of opening one, but it, it is their goal. All right, yes. This is our, we have time for one last question, which I'm going to eat up mostly by walking across this large room. So I've always heard that coyotes don't really pose a threat to humans. Um, but I used to live in Mount Washington, and I used to see packs of like six or seven, and I would sit in my car and wait for the packs to leave. Um, so I'm just wondering, in your work, how many incidents did you kind of come across where a human was uh, attacked by a coyote, whether it was saving their pet or, or not? Yeah. Um, coyote attacks are extremely rare. Um, as far as getting a pet, um, that kind of depends on what neighborhood you are in, and there's a lot of factors that come into play. One is, um, how urban the area is and if there's a lot of native prey for them to um, eat or not eat. And then um, also, are people feeding coyotes in that neighborhood? And if they are, then that creates a, a sense of habituation. And so then they become more bold and more likely to approach human residences looking for ornamental fruit and pets and and that in itself can really kind of be passed on from generation to generation. And there are incidents, that even in Griffith Park, where um, uh, behavior was passed on where they were taught to basically nip at their parents to get food, and they associated people as just another coyote that has food. And so the one uh, young coyote nipped at the heel of a, a homeless person uh, sleeping in the park and it was considered a coyote attack. Um, another thing that I'll say is that just because coyotes are closer um, than you want them to be um, doesn't mean that they're aggressive. They have this flight distance that varies across individuals, across packs, and so just because they're close by doesn't mean that they're habituated either because they feel comfortable because they know they can outrun you um, until you get a certain feet away, few, uh, amount of feet away, and so um, that's another misconception is coyotes being seeing coyotes and seeing them close. It means that they're dangerous or habituated. That's another misconception. Um, but as far as cats, they hate cats. Um, even if they don't want to eat them, they'll kill them. Um, they see them as competitors in the ecosystem, same as gray foxes. And the more urban the neighborhood, the more that they'll start considering them as, as prey, as regular sources of prey. Um, so it's up to us, again, to keep our chihuahuas, our Pomeranians, our house cats inside because coyotes will always be here, uh, no matter what we do. Thanks right. for that question. All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks to the panelists, Miguel and Daniel.